Good morning, everybody. I've got a good friend named Brett Jones that was in Mexico. And he was uh, just really learning Spanish. He's actually pretty good at it now, but this was years and years ago when he first started trying to learn. And he was at a Coke stand and had ordered a Coke. And so the young lady, who was an older teenage girl, had provided him a can of Coke. So when he saw it was a can, he uh, wanted glass. So he then at, pre, tried to ask her for a little glass. And so when he did, he, he tried to use his Spanish and told her that he needed a poquito beso. So all the Spanish-speaking people in the room are already laughing, so let me fill all the rest of us gringos in <clears throat> on, on the secret here in a minute. Immediately, the girl freaks out. She freaks out on him, and, and he's, he sees the alarm on her face and says, no, 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 just pe pequito beso, pequito beso, and and, and the more he says it, the more alarmed she gets until she runs through the back door and suddenly there's a moment of silence exploded by an irate father coming out. And he starts to lay in to Brett telling him uh, whatever he was saying to him in Spanish. And so Brett is still trying to plead his case. Piquito beso, and he's, and he's trying to motion it. And finally... The father figures out what's going wrong with this white dude, and he realize, he says, "Oh, piquito vaso," which means little glass. And then he informs Brett that what he was asking for in the beginning was a little kiss. <laughs> over and over and over, could I get a little kiss to go with this coat? He almost lost his life that day in Mexico because he was not speaking the same language as this young lady or this father. It's important to speak the right language. Can I get an amen in the house? You know, we've probably all been in a situation where we're desperately trying to communicate with someone that speaks another language and we realize that they don't have what we have and we don't have what they have but we know something needs to be communicated then we don't run the other way we stay in there and we try to figure it out we we, we grunt we we motion we talk slower thinking that that's going to actually help them to understand what we're saying better and we, we draw pictures, we do whatever we have to do, as awkward as it seems, to stay there and try to find this, this meeting at a common goal. You know, marriage is a lot like that. And we are uh, coming off the heels of our Thanksgiving, uh, I mean, of Thanksgiving, of our Valentine's week. A little bit, a little bit behind. I am thankful for you, Melissa. <laughs> See what I did there? For Valentine's week, we're coming off the heels of that. I trust you had a good Valentine's week. And, and uh, so I, I want to talk to us about marriage today. And even if you're not married, then I, it's okay. I want to uh, just help you out, and uh, if you're planning on getting married anytime ever, then you can just take some notes, and it'll, this will help you uh, this week. So <clears throat> um, we've probably all been in a situation where we're desperately trying to communicate with one another in marriage, in a relationship, in, in a relationship of any kind. It can happen. And so today... I want to talk about building my marriage, and you can use the principles here in whatever uh, relationship that you're in. God made us so different as men and women, and meeting one another's needs can be extremely challenging. It takes a selfless mentality 
to make it happen. Now, I need to set the precedent here that only God can meet your deepest needs. I need to say this again. Only God can meet your deepest needs. No person can do that. You hear a lot of young people, a lot of people that are, that come from desperate backgrounds, that they'll look at each other and, you know, the guy will say, oh, you complete me, and the girl will say, you complete me, and, 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 and suddenly there's this pressure on the relationship subconsciously that neither person can withstand, and what happens is that they think, well, I'm damaged, you're damaged, so let's get together. And, and, uh, and if, if I'm incomplete and you're incomplete, then you'll fill in all the holes where I'm complete and I'll fill in the spaces where you're incomplete and maybe we'll be complete together. But can I tell you something? Incompletion plus incompletion does not equal completion. Incompletion plus incompletion equals double incompletion. It only exacerbates the problem. And if you think you had trouble before, you've only just begun experiencing the trouble that you will ex eventually experience because only God can offer us completion. We get God to complete us and then from a place of completion, then we find another complete person and then from that space where God has taken care of the deepest core needs of us, then we can take care of the peripheral needs of one another that are still there, but they're not the, perif they're not the needs of the soul and the spirit. Here's the, here's the deal is that uh, uh, we, ha we, can have, we can have soulmates, uh, your, your spouse can be your soulmate. A sibling can be your soulmate. A best friend can be a soulmate for you. A warrior on the battlefield, a fellow warrior can be a soulmate. You've experienced things together. You've gone through hell and back together. Your souls are linked together. And, and even two men can become soulmates in that way. Two women can become soulmates in that way. But there's only one spirit mate, and that's Jesus. Because you can allow people into your soul, but only one gets to be allowed in your spirit, and that's Jesus Christ. He's a, he has a throne in there that nobody else gets to sit on. And so today, I wanna encourage you to first make sure that you are letting God be your all in all. And then that person that maybe you're in a relationship with, beginning a relationship with, or married to can help you in the other areas of your life. But you do that plump from a place of overflow and the completion that God has already provided you in your life. If you marry someone and they're the right person and they're normal, then they're probably not gonna be like you. They're gonna be different. Here's the deal. There's a reason why the book was written, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Because the fact is men and women are completely different. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give you some straight talk here today from, from some of the psychology works and marriage counseling sessions. When, when you grow up, and there's sadly so many precious people that fit this bill. When you grow up in a home where you've been wounded, if you're a young man or a young woman, either way, you've been wounded by a parent of the opposite sex, then you're gonna struggle with the ability to work those differences out as, you're, as an adult with the opposite sex. It's gonna be a problem. You're gonna struggle in every one of those areas. It's why so many in this generation who have grown up basically fatherless have taken the path of least resistance, which is same-sex attraction. It's what's happening in our society, but it is not what God intended. Satan takes that which should have been a best friend situation, 
a covenant sister or brother situation. And he tries to replace that with God's, tries to replace God's model for marriage. And as tough as a man and a woman committing to one another for life, for better, for worse, think about the commitment we made for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, as tough as all that can be, a selfless attitude is the key to making it work. A selfless attitude will help you to serve one another, will help you get out of your own wounds, will help you come into a place of healing with God, a place of love with God. God God can begin to get in there and heal the things that are broken and messed up. And then from that place will help you to begin to do the work that it takes to have a beautiful and healthy, godly marriage. A selfless attitude is what makes it happen. The great marriage guru, Jimmy Evans, said this, the greatest marriage is two servants in love. The worst is to masters in love. Marriage experts from across the country have established the top needs of women and the top needs of men from information gathered in countless marriage sessions. And here, in a nutshell, here's what what they've come up with. For men, guys, here's your top four needs. Number one, right off the top is honor and respect. Men just desire to be honored. They desire to be respected. Number two, you knew it was up there. I am. Men desire sex. Number three, fun and friendship. They, they want to have somebody, a partner to have fun with, go on an adventure with. And number four, support at home. Peace, tranquility, somebody that believes in them when they get home. For women, counseling psychologists have said their number one need across the board is security. I just need to know, are you going to be here for me for the long haul? I need to know, are you going to love me forever? Number two, sorry, brothers. <laughs> Listen, yours didn't even make her top four list. Okay? Number two, non sexual affection. Holding hands, an arm around the shoulder that's, that, you know, an uh, 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 arm around the waist that's not leading anywhere. It's, it's not taking off anywhere, okay? Just, it just stops right there. It, listen, brothers, if you get that right, then, then, then maybe the reward will come later. It, <laughs> no, number three, communication. This right here, eye to eye. And you can say, well, we go to the movies together. Well, that's good. Going to the movies together is good. But, but it's, it's this. It's shoulder to shoulder. It's focused on something else. That there has to be eye to eye. That ladies, ladies are asking for communication and they're not asking for the nutshelled version of your story that you finally wound up in after you told it to three of your buddies at work. She needs the best version with all the bells and whistles. She wants to know when it happened, what happened, what everybody thought about it, how you felt about it, and wants to know probably what time it was when it, when it went down. Details, brothers, details. And then number four, leadership. And I'm not talking about dominance. I'm talking about leadership because no woman respects a weak man. I'm not talking about toxic masculinity where you're pounding your chest and breaking things and talking about this is my castle and I'm the king of it. That's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about Humble, strong, firm belief in yourself and gentle, meek, which is not weak, but it's controlled strength leadership in the home. So when you put it, when you, when you really look at the top shelf, the mega need for men is honor. It's honor. They desire honor. Mega need for women is security. 
People in modern day times have, have expounded on the truth. They've written whole books about it, but the Bible told us this thousands of years ago. Actually, Paul wrote it in Ephesians 5 and 33. He said, so, I, so again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself. Why? Because she desires security. I just need to know that I'm going to be loved, that when you said I do, you meant it for the rest of your life, and I don't have to walk around worrying about it. And then the wife must respect her husband. Why? Because men desire honor and respect. And there it is. It's the secret to the mega need of the husband and the mega need of the wife. To meet those needs, however, you can, you can develop a selfless attitude and decide, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to meet the needs of my, of my husband. I'm going to meet the needs of my wife. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this thing right. But now we got to walk in translation because what are the needs of my wife? And I have to realize that just because I desire something doesn't mean that she desires it. Or if you're a lady, just because I desire something doesn't mean that he desires it. So I've got to translate this thing for, for in, in what is called a language of love. We have to learn to speak one another's language. We're, we're just going to call it your love language. And your love language will depend on how you're wired, whether you're a man or a woman. So I want to give you the five love languages real quick that, that one author wrote out and spelled out for us. The first love language is words of affirmation. That means that you feel most loved when somebody's telling you how they appreciate you. They're telling you what they love about you. They're telling you how great you are. They, they, they're, they're giving you attaboys and attagirls. They're, they're, they're encouraging you and, and, and uh, honoring you in that way. The second love language is quality time. It's, it, and, and it's not just time, it's quality time. Eye-to-eye -eye contact, time communicating, time talking. Number three gift is receiving gifts. You feel most appreciated when somebody took the time to make you a craft or make something for you or give you a gift or they, they, they took the time to go purchase something for you and they blessed you or they, they brought you flowers, whatever. You, when you receive that gift, your love language causes you to feel most appreciated by that. Number four, acts of service. They don't have to give you a gift. They just did something for you. They went out of their way. They took the time to bless you with, with their time, with their, with their energy. They, they, they set something up for you. They set up a room for you. They, they, they uh, d drove you somewhere, what, whatever it might be. And then number five is physical touch, uh, a, a pat on the hand, a uh, uh, a pat on the shoulder, just a, a hug, a, a, uh, a something, something tangible that they do that lets you know that, that you mean something to them. Now, my love language in my life and in my marriage is number one, words of affirmation. And that's pretty, pretty top for me. Words of affirmation. Secondly, physical touch. That's why I'm a hugger. So, Words of affirmation, physical touch. But my wife's love language is quality time. And so if, if I, I, can, I can go to her and I can be telling her how beautiful she looks, I can be telling her how amazing I think she is, which is my love language, and I'm giving her what I want, but if her love language is quality time and I haven't spent any of that with her, then all of my words are going to fall to the ground. She, she, she might even translate it as me trying to get out of the doghouse. In fact, we've had this discussion before where I've said to her, uh, you know, I, when she's telling me I don't feel appreciated by you, and I, I would say, I, 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 just, I just told you yesterday that I loved you. I just told you how beautiful you were. I just told you how amazing you are. How can you say that? But then, then she would tell me, well, we haven't spent time together. Uh, another time I got real honest with her, and I said, I, I, don't, I don't know that, that I don't feel that adoration from you anymore. 
I, I, don't, I don't feel like we felt when we were younger where, where when you looked at me, I was your everything. I, I, don't, I don't feel that. And, and I was honest with her and she took it and listened to it. But then I had to hear the hard return that when she told me that the reason why you don't see that in my eyes is there's been no quality time lately. We're so busy. We're running here and running there. And where's our date nights? And where's this? And where's that? And I had to stop and, and hear the hard truth. I, I have stopped speaking her language. And when I stopped speaking her language, then I, the adoration was lost. Then my number one need stops getting met, which is a desire for respect and a desire for honor. Because to get this thing right, we have to walk in a selfless attitude, a selfless heart that speaks, that endeavors to speak the language of the person that we are that we are trying to please. I, I, I can walk around, and this is where guys get in trouble all the time. If, if their language is physical touch, but their, their wife's love language is, uh, is uh, quality, or what, what was it, gifts, uh, receiving of gifts, then, and you haven't bought her flowers in a long time, then you're walking up to her trying to speak your love language with physical touch, and she is not responding the way that you wish that she would respond because basically you're speaking Russian and she's speaking Swahili. <laughs> and that's why there's no real love communication in the home. Everybody, everybody loves the concept of being in love, of the butterflies, oh, I'm so in love. Psychology experts will say that the electricity of romance, the butterflies, the ah, I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't focus, I can't work. Remember those days when you were first in love? I'm so in love feeling. Experts say that that lasts about two years in a relationship and many times less than that. A couple gets married, and what happens? Well, they, for like the first few months, first year, whatever, they can't take their eyes off each other. They can't take their hands off each other. And that lasts for a while, but then what happens? Life. Life happens. Kids happen. <laughs> Little league happens. Dance happens. Insurance increases happen. Need for a bigger home happens. Jobs happen. Work schedules happen. Family disagreements happen. And life sets in. Maybe he wants the anniversary where everything is aimed on the beach and eventually getting back to the room every night. And she wants the anniversary where they're gonna have plenty of time to gaze into each other's eyes and talk. talk and talk and talk and talk he wants a truck for sporting and hauling stuff <laughs> She wants a sleek SUV or minivan for hauling kids and packages. She wants to go visit her parents, but he starts making up excuses why he's got some things to do during that time. And soon what happens? The, you get put enough of those together, the euphoria starts to wear off and couples then have a choice to make. Many will grab the mic at that point and play like they're in a Top Gun movie and start singing, you lost that love and feeling. And they say things like, well, we just fell out of love. They withdraw, they separate, they divorce, and they set off in search of another in love experience. And I'm not saying that God can't restore and redeem, and I'm not saying that God can't help you after your life has just been broken in pieces to start over again, and, and that God can't give you a second marriage that, that is redeemed. And, and man, well, I just blew it so bad on that first one. I'm not saying that that can't happen, okay? So please understand me, but you can't argue with statistics. For those of you that are struggling in your first one right now, 
and you're tempted to give up, do you know that the rate of divorce in second marriages is higher than it is in first marriages? And the rate of divorce in third marriages is higher than it is in second marriages. In other words, it just keeps on getting worse if we don't get the problem fixed. But here's where we want to go. At that point, when you feel like you've lost that love and feeling, I would pray for you and hope that you would start right there and begin the hard work of learning to love each other without the euphoria of the in love obsession. When the chill bumps and the butterflies leave, there is where, there is where the real work of truly being in love truly starts. And we move from a temporary emotional high to a pursuit of real love. This kind of love is still emotional in nature, but it is not obsessional. It's love that unites reason and emotion. It involves a daily act of the will waking up every day deciding you're gonna will yourself to stay strong in this relationship. It requires discipline according to the covenant that you made with one another, and it recognizes the necessity of personal growth. I need to grow. And you're looking at a guy right here after, I, I'm, I'm about to celebrate 33 years of marriage here in the month of May. But I'm going to tell you plainly that God has been kicking my tail more in the past year than he ever has in 33 years of marriage because he has shown me glaring problems in my part of the relationship. I feel like I'm in more of a boot camp with God right now in my marriage relationship than I've ever been in my life. God having to remind me of some things that he said in this word Remind me of how I am called to love this woman. And if we, will, if we will let God speak to us, if we'll let God give us the discipline to do this thing right, then our relationships can last, not just for the long haul, but for the long haul and keep their fireworks. And I'll get to that in just a second. And in fact, can I tell you that it's been said that true love can't even begin until the in love experience has run its course. It's kind of like when Jesus asked us in Matthew 5, 46, he said, if you love only those who love you, what good is that? Even scoundrels do that much. If you are friendly only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even the heathen do that. What he's trying to tell us is that, is that uh, it's easy for me to do all these amazing things when I got all the goosebumps in the relationship and it's new. But one counselor said, I, I can't even take credit for the kind and generous things that I do while I'm under the influence of the obsession because I'm being driven and pushed and carried along by this instinctual force that goes below, beyond my normal behavior patterns. But if once I return to the real world of human choice, I choose to be kind and generous to my wife, even when we're having times of differences, then that's real love. True love says, I'm married to you, and I choose to look out for your best interests even when it feels inconvenient for me. Now, I got to tell you here, I am... A stone cold, hopeless romantic. My wife laughs at me all the time. I can walk through a room and I, I it's, brothers, if you try to take my man card, I'll fight you for it. But, <laughs> but when, when I walk through a room, I can get sucked into that stupid Hallmark movie in a heartbeat. 
because there's just something that's romantic to me about two people fighting through all of the nonsense and all of the, the, the tribulation and winding up together. I, I love, uh, I, I'm, I'm romantic in my mind and in my heart. And, and I'll be honest with you and tell you that I'm one that could ask in response to this message, but, but wait, love is an attitude with an appropriate behavior? I mean, what kind of definition is that? It seems so sterile. Where are the shooting stars, man? Where are the, where are the deep emotions, all the balloons being loose? What about the crazy excitement? What about the, the heart flutters, the, the fairy tale feeling, the sonic kisses and all the stuff that goes along with it? When we were first together in this relationship, I don't know about you, for I, for one, have not been willing to lose that, to, to stop believing for that. So actually, can I tell you this, that I don't believe that that has to go away. I do believe that, that you know, you got to calm down a little bit. My dad told me early in the relationship, when I, when I felt that calm down feeling start to happen, he said, he said my Lord, son. He said, God, God will let you calm down a little bit or you'd never come to work again. <laughs> you know, you can't live in that, can't work, can't, can't sleep, can't eat. You can't live there forever. At some point, you got to settle down and, and know that I am in love with this person even if I don't feel all the stuff that I first felt when it was an adventure and a challenge and I was trying to win them and I wasn't sure if they were gonna love me back. Now I gotta calm down and do the real work of love. But here's the deal, here's the deal, please hear me. I believe that God wants you to have those emotions in your marriage, but the way to get there for the long term is through making the long-term decision to learn each other's love language and then commit to speaking it. Even when it's not what you think you need, you do it because you know it's what they need. And then deciding to live a lifestyle of meeting each other's needs in a selfless way. And when we get that right, then it will produce an emotional feeling in your spouse and cause that romance to be rekindled and to start flowing again. It will create an excitement. It will create a freshness from a deeper love than anything that we felt when it was merely new infatuation. It's a deep love. And here's the deal. This action is really only produced in us by the Holy Spirit. The musicians would come. It's only produced in us by the Holy Spirit, who is, by the way, the spirit of selflessness. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of selflessness. The spirit that was in Jesus, that empowered him to set his own interests aside, to give his life for his bride, the church. Ephesians 5 clearly tells us that as wives, wives are, are to submit to their husbands. The key is as unto the Lord. It's not meant for you to become a slave. God never intended for you to be a floor mat to your husband. He didn't intend for you to become um, his his. Uh, indentured servant. He didn't mean for you to be lorded over or manipulated or controlled or strong-armed. In fact, submission has nothing to do with your husband. It's all about you. It's you saying the verse before that, bud, lest you be pounding your chest, let's go back to the verse before that one that says, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, we are to submit to one another in the Lord, which means we're equal in the sight of God. One of us is not above the other. But in this house, I recognize that God wants you to take the lead spiritually. 
Sadly, too many ladies have had to take the lead because the husbands won't connect to God. But what God wants is for a lady to say, I'm going to start treating you like you're the spiritual leader. And I'm going to keep praying and believing in faith in you, even if you're not that yet. I want you to know I support you and I believe you can do this. And I'm going to give you a gift from my place of wholeness and power and strength as your equal. I'm going to give you a gift. And my gift to you is my submission. You can't make me give it. You can't take You can't exact it from me because then it wouldn't be submission. It would be slavery. You can't make me do this. This is, me, this is between me and Jesus, not me and you. And I'm going to give you this gift. And when that, when that happens, something happens in the, in the heart of a man. He, there's a respect. There's an honor that he feels aimed at him that gives him a belief that he can do anything, that he can conquer anything, that he can be the man that, he, that God's called him to be. And then the Bible says in Ephesians 5, for the husband to love the wife. And the wives may say, well, <laughs> big whoop. I got to submit. All he's got to do is love. What's the deal with that? Oh, hold on a minute. Because read the rest. It says, husbands, love your wives. How much? How? As Christ loved the church. Well, how much is that? And gave his life for her. Can, can I submit to you that that is the ultimate act of submission? Because Jesus, as the groom, loved his bride, the church, so much that he put his best interests on the back burner for, for her good. He put all that he wanted, all that he would have chosen for himself back here to put, to lift her up and to make her be able to be all that God wanted her to be. And when we're doing this and we're loving one another in this selfless way, it creates this beauty in the home that looks like heaven is supposed to look. And can I tell you, that is the relationship that we are to have with Jesus as his bride. Every one of us in this place, male and female alike, we are called the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. And Jesus is the groom. And it's how we're supposed to live our lives for him. He already gave everything for us. He gave his all for us. He put all of his best interests aside for our good. And now our life and our love back to him as his bride is not about an emotional high of this goosebump feeling, can't, can't work, can't eat, can't sleep, in love with Jesus kind of thing that we felt maybe when we first got saved. But now the honeymoon has felt like it's kind of wore off. And now I'm wondering, where's the goosebumps, Jesus? Oh, he said, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. Now we're going to work on real love. Not just an emotional high of a new religious experience. Now we're going to work on me and you putting a real love together, which means you wake up every day. Get, get, listen, now I didn't know what I was preaching today, but she got up here and said every morning we need to wake up by faith, even though we don't feel it and say, hello, peace. Hello, joy. Hello, love. I don't feel it today, but woo, he hello. I'm saying I'm saying in my faith, my son Gentry didn't know what I was preaching today. But in our leadership team meeting out there this morning, he talked about getting up and, and the intentionality of going after God and his strength every day, even though we don't feel like doing it. We get up and we do it by faith. It's still crazy after all these years of doing this that God sets that kind of stuff up. It is a life of choosing to live for Christ because he gave his all for us. And here's the beautiful thing. The more we choose that selfless life of waking up and opening our Bible when we don't feel like opening it up and waking up a little bit earlier and getting in a room in a quiet place and walking the floor or kneeling down and saying, God, I'm going to start this day off right. I'm going to talk to you. I'm a, I pray you would help me. You would bless me today, God. Help me to know my assignment today. And we spend time with him. And then we're, we're obedient to the voice of his spirit in our lives. And we're serving others and we're loving others and we're doing good deeds for people 
people and we're walking in the good works that he's called us to work even on days that we ourselves are having a bad day we're still blessing others out there even though I feel like I wish somebody would bless me but I'm going to keep doing what my groom has called me to do and I, I'm going to keep on walking with him by faith I'm going to keep on putting one foot of the other I'm going to keep on putting the work in my relationship with Jesus I'm going to keep on doing my due diligence and, and walking this thing out by faith if I will do that, then here's what's happened. Here, here's what's going to happen. I will fall more deeply in love with him as I follow my faith. And then God will give me emotions more and more as my love deepens. And the more I walk with him, the more my love will grow for him. And the more when Satan sends enticements my way, I will be able to say no to those enticements because I'm not willing to do anything that will compromise my commitment and my love with Jesus. Would you stand with me across the room? I wonder if you just close your eyes across the room for a second. I, I, I just... I felt like the Holy Spirit told me this week that he was going to do something special. And I want to talk to two groups of people right now. I want to talk to those of you who you're struggling in your marriage and you need God to do something different. You need God to make a change for you. You need, you need some healing. You need some revolution. You need God to help you to look at each other in different ways and start the hard work of, of trying to really speak one another's language and meeting each other in that place of commonality in that selfless, with that selfless heart. If that's you, I'm, I'm about to ask you to step out from where you're standing and come stand to the front of this building in just a moment. The second group of people that I'm, that I'm speaking to is those of you that you are applying this to you and Jesus, you being the church and him being the groom, the bride and the groom. And you know that you have let your relationship with him slip and you've gotten discouraged and disillusioned because you thought this thing would be more than this. And you've stopped praying and you've stopped reading his word and you've stopped doing the things that make your relationship deepen. And you know you need to get beyond the need for goosebumps and you need to get to true committed love. If that's you, I'm asking you to step out from where you're standing and come. Which, what, which one of those two groups are you in? If, that's, if, you, if one of those is you, then I'm asking you right now to step out from where you're standing and come stand across the front of this building. And I want to pray for you today. I want to pray that God will bring healing in your life, healing in your relationship with one another, healing in your relationship with Jesus, whatever it might be. I want to tell you there is no shame in you stepping out. If I wasn't up here preaching, I'd be grabbing my wife's hand and coming down here myself because God knows we've been in this boot camp for the last year. We have been working harder on our relationship in the last year than I think we ever have in almost 33 years because we want to get this right. I want to get it right. And if you're struggling in your relationship with God, then God wants you to go to a deeper place. He wants you to go deeper. I'm just asking Josh and this team for the next few minutes to just lead us back into worship. And while these are praying, then I want you to just begin to pray for them. Or while Josh is singing, while the team is singing, then I want you to just follow what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. If you're still standing there, but you know you need to get down here while we're lifting our eyes up to God and we're just talking to Him right now, I want you to step out. Just come. Come on. Come whenever you want to come. If you want to just stand right where you are and pray, let's ask God for His intervention in our life. God, I want my relationships to be strong. I want to walk in purity. I want to walk in holiness. I want to be madly in love with everything that you've called me to do, God. Come on.
as these are continuing to pray here if you have never said yes to jesus maybe what i'm saying to you is a, is a struggle because you're you don't re really even know what it means to have jesus help you to have the the holy spirit the spirit that gave jesus the power to love his bride the way he did and the way he does if you if you've never experienced him then today you can do that today is the day jesus jesus came to die for my sins and your sins he took our sins on the cross and died with our sins. He was buried in the grave and our sins were buried with him. But, and when he rose from the dead, he left our sins in the grave. And when he ascended into the heavens, he did it so that he could send back the Holy Spirit that was living in his heart to now come and live in ours, to give us the same power to live the way he lived and love the way he loved. And now the Spirit of Jesus is here to live in our hearts. And the way to receive him is by confessing that he is Lord in your life and opening up your heart to him. If you would like to do that, then I'm asking you to do it with me right now. Church, would you just help us out? We're going to pray. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me so much. You gave your only son to die for my sins. Jesus, I believe you rose from the dead. I open my heart to you. Forgive me of my sins. Be my Savior. Be the Lord of my life. Come and live in my heart and fill me with your Holy Spirit, the spirit of selflessness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, can we give God some praise for that right now? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you said yes to Jesus today, we want to help you to know what your next steps are. Don't walk this thing by yourself. There's a card in the seat back in front of you. You can fill out or you can take a picture of the QR code and uh, it'll lead you to steps. Turn it in out there to the info center. Tell them I made a decision for Jesus. What's my next step? And they're going to help you to know there's a whole process of growth that we want to take you through and walk with you every step of the way. We love you so much. We bless you. If you need prayer for anything specific today and you didn't get prayer earlier today, if you'll just come down to the front, our prayer team will meet you here. We love you so much. Have a beautiful and blessed week in Jesus.